Well, my name is Dan Strongen, and uh, I want to welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming to the webinar. I'm the owner of a company called Nan ManageNaturally.com, and it's a coaching service for organizations of all sizes. I worked mostly with small and medium, but I have done projects with very large companies as well. The topic of our webinar today is how to fail in a recession. Uh, one of the great advantages I have uh, doing the job I do as a business coach, talking to a lot of different companies, and as a co-founder of the Deming Collaboration, is um, you get exposed to a wide variety of organizations, and you get to learn at least as much from the people that you work with as they learn from you. I've seen companies succeed, and I've seen companies fail. I've seen them rise up, be born again, and then fail again. And in fact, uh, under normal circumstances, I don't know if you can read this, but it says survival rates of new establishments from the second quarter of 1998 by sector. And the white line is one year, the grayer line is two years, the even more gray is three years, and the black line is four years. And, and what you find is that 44% of all startups fail in the first two years, then about half that number again in the next two years. And that's across all industries, uh, from natural resources, construction, manufacturing, all the way down to leisure and hospitality and other services. So what that means is, is that in spite of all the books, webinars, executive MBA programs, and consultants like myself, you are just as likely to fail in the first four years as you are to succeed. So really, in spite of all this combined wisdom, it's not that much different than flipping a coin. And that's a shame. To address this failure gap and help you find the nine or ten steps that could tip the scale, I decided to focus on how to fail uh, so that you can take advantage of this recession and the worst one yet to come if that's your goal, but also if that's not your goal, by focusing on what to do to fail, then it's fairly easy to figure out what not to do to succeed. Uh, to quote the infamous economist Bob Dylan, there is no success like failure and that failure is no success at all. Corporate America and the consultants, schools, and media who serve them like to present an image of prudence and stability, like they know what they're doing in every circumstance. But as we've seen a number of times in recent years, uh, given the slightest opportunity, whole industries like banking and finance, energy, the automotive industries, will act more like crazed, drunken street gamblers. And the problem with gambling is that gambling has odds you can't defeat unless you cheat, and you can only cheat for so long before the ads ca odds catch up to you. So let's share some ways to tip the scales towards failure. And don't worry if you have a business, uh, even if you're a consultant, you still have a business. And generally, consultants, I know from personal experience, are like doctors uh, treating themselves as what they're worst at. So you're probably doing some of these already. The first number one way to ensure that you fail is to get lost in spreadsheets. Uh, the second is to never set foot where the work is done. The problem is, is that spreadsheets are what has already happened. And just like driving in a, in a, in a very... Um, rapidly changing and varied economic environment that we live in, you kind of want to keep your eyes on the road and see what's coming and what has happened isn't necessarily going to help you. So if you want to fail, the first step is to keep your focus on what has already happened. It's a powerful way to ensure failure, like driving while looking only through the rearview mirror. And the best tools to use to ensure that you are operating your business from results from the past is to use your profit and loss statement and your balance sheet. Now I know there are probably people who don't agree with me on this, but in my experience, financial reports are one of the number one reasons why so many businesses fail. Because unlike reality, which is messy and sometimes difficult to understand, spreadsheets are clean, logical, 
You can spend hours of your day away from, away from where the money is really made, finding patterns, even when those patterns don't exist. Whether you get your P&L monthly or weekly, or it's updated in real time because it's backward looking and follows financial and not operational models, it is usually too late to know what really happened. And you can spend hours coming up with creative explanations for the funny figures you find in papers. In fact, I myself, when I was a boss, got other people to waste hours of the company's time coming up with creative explanations. To manage well, you need forward thinking reports and reliable prediction. What was is no longer. Wasting time fixing what was is a sure way to failure. I shudder to remember all the times I sat combing through results on spreadsheets to find an explanation what, for what turned out to be unknowable or only happened once or worse was an error in the data on the spreadsheet. Hours which could have been spent in the work floor observing what was really going on in the moment while a sale was happening or while my customer was interacting with me and my product or service. The second, or should I say the fourth step, is to forget who you are. Generally when business gets bad, business owners and managers start doing a kind of random walkabout, picking on any little thing they see, desperately trying to find anything, something that will turn things around. Right? And generally, the last thing they'll do is completely change the way they do business and transform the way they do business. Generally what they want is, in my experience, to do things the way they've always done them but have them work. And that is a great way to fail. Abandoning what little vision you started with, if you started with a vision, and randomly seizing on things to change in order to confront phantom solutions to causes that are really beyond your control, like there's a recession, so people are buying less, they're using less services, is a great way to waste what are even more valuable resources in the time of a recession. Even best is not to have any vision of who you are at all and to have no easily uttered common goal for everybody to rally on. Because as the old saying goes, if you aren't going anywhere in particular, any path you take will get you there. Now, banks give lines of credit based on assets. So the next thing to do is to make sure that you tie up all your money in inventory. Why banks give lines of credit on assets and rarely on the quality of the idea or the people in the company is something that really is a mystery to me. But it's a great aid to ensuring failure, especially when revenue is slow and cash flow becomes a problem. Let's take all the available cash we can get and sock it into inventory that will only lose its value as it sits due to deflation, damage and theft and ensure we have no money to purchase raw materials or to pay people to do the work. And if you secure your cash flow through it, as many of my clients have, like many people's mortgages in this market, the value borrowed will quickly be more than the sellable value of the inventory. Time and again, I have been asked to step in and help clients that were literally choking in their own inventory. And very much related to this is buy lots of tools. Spend all kinds of money in a recession on capital goods. You know, if your business is bad, what you need is the newest, latest computer system. That's what will save you. Don't laugh. I worked with companies that have done this. Uh, if you can trap your money that could be working in tools and in support and uh, bringing in all kinds of people who don't add value to the product or service you sell. Um, it's a great way to go out of business. I worked with one company that spent its last liquid dime on buying state-of-the-art equipment to take on a larger competitor. And they were pretty big to start out with. Only to find in the end, their cost of production was still higher than the competitor. They failed within a few years and that was in an up market. Support functions, while necessary, generate no sales. Zippo, 
just like spreadsheets. Spreadsheets don't sell things. They generate no sales. They track, they move, they inspect, they order, they threaten, and they sit in endless meetings, yes. But only those functions which add value directly to a product make money for a company. So every excessive dollar invested in support functions is a dollar that is choking sales and profits. General Motors was the master of socking money into support rather than value-adding functions. Their middle-level management was many times more bloated than Toyota's, for instance, and it's no small wonder Toyota was 10 times more profitable on the same level of sales. Toyota is surviving a recession, a massive recall, and a nuclear accident, and despite the $30 billion in profit that GM miraculously found right before they went public and then lost as soon as they went public, GM had to be bailed out. What better way to fail than to fix the wrong things? What better way to waste precious resources on things that make no difference at all to your overall performance? Like a chain, fixing anything but the weakest link is a glorious waste of time. Thank you, Dr. Goldratt. Roll out your black and green belts and perfect those processes, all of them, but be sure not to work on the weakest link because that will actually make a difference. That's one of the secrets to failing. For those who don't get the analogy, if you pull a chain, it'll always break at the weakest link. Even if five other links are weak as well, strengthening them won't help. Either pull the chain no harder than the weakest link can stand, or strengthen the weakest link. Anything else is a waste of time and money. And the reality is, we all work with limited resources. There's never enough time and there's never enough money. So it's not a question of continuous improvement of everything so much as continuous improvement of what matters right now if you want to succeed. So to fail, focus on perfecting every process, especially the processes that don't, that don't matter, it's what Dr. Deming used to call sub-optimization. Making the parts optimal never, never helps make the whole, the entire system optimal. Some things have to be suppressed so that the entire system can be optimal. And then if that hasn't worked and you're still finding that because of loyalty from the past, for some reason you're not out of business yet, um, when things get stressful, there's nothing that works better for failure than to abuse the people you work, who work for you. Push them to the limit so they break. Rob them of their dignity and they'll give you less and less. Whatever you do, don't allow them the chance to use their natu natural creative abilities by creating as many barriers as you can to their being able to take pride in the quality of their work. People who enjoy their work are easy to work with, so make them unhappy. That way, maybe they'll chase away your last remaining customers. And one of the best ways to make them unhappy is to keep the company buried in dysfunction. Perhaps the greatest game to play on the road to ruin is the blame game. In order to ensure that somehow the people you work with don't spontaneously find ways to actually make things function better, keep them focused on internal politics and competition. Bury them in dysfunction. Use Lee Iacocca's Mushroom School of Management, where you keep them in the dark, you bury them in BS, and you scream at them, grow. And to be sure they don't spontaneously get better on their own, never train. Because continuing to do the same things is mentioned over and over again while expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Now, Ben Franklin said that first. But even better than Ben Franklin, leave all the training to those who are doing it now, like most companies do. So all the bad habits and misunderstandings they have acquired over time can be passed on to those they train. Whatever you do, if you want to fail, do not study your processes, do not improve your system, and never put a dime into real training by those trained to train within your organization with consistent practice and agreed upon definitions. 
and methods. Because that makes things too easy to predict. And if you can predict, you can manage, and that leads to success, not failure. Oh, here's a toast to the blind leading the blind. The other thing to do is put up a lot of barriers to people's ability to work. Nothing works better for failure than blocking the flow. And last of all, pay no attention to that old saying that you should be spending 80% of your time with the customers you have and only 20% trying to get new customers. Do what most companies do in a recession. Spend all your time trying to get new accounts and pay no attention to your current customers. Whatever you do, don't go out. Don't talk to them. Don't try to see through their eyes. Just take them at face value when they say, oh, I need this or I don't need anything. Thank you very much. Don't try to figure out what would really make their life easier and try to provide it because one thing you can do during this time period, since you're not going to do the same amount of business anyways, if you want to succeed, is to really build good relationships with the customers you make the most money from, your regular loyal customers. Now, at this point I want to come to an upfront agreement with everybody. Um, our time is precious just like yours, so I don't want to be spending my time chasing everybody. So I promise to put as much as I can into this. Obviously, in a short time period, there's not going to be uh, a lot of uh, time to go into any depth, but you get an idea of the kinds of things that we talk about. What I want in return from you is this. Uh, if you are not interested at the end of this, uh, please feel free to walk away. Um, it was very nice having you. I hope I entertained you a little bit. And you won't get bothered by me too much, except that you may get mailings until you um, look down at the bottom of the mailing saying, I don't want to get these anymore about other webinars that we or I might do. If you are interested in pursuing further uh, the services that we offer, our services are really, first and foremost, online peer groups which allow people at about the same level in management to get together in a facilitated format um, using some of these ideas and the ideas of Dr. Deming as the base to sit and talk to each other on a regular basis, uh, take time away but at a very affordable rate and very little time to really find people you can talk to about your business and help understanding what's going on in your business. These are not didactic training sessions. These are really interactive sessions leveraging everyone who's involved but with the aim of uh, solving pragmatic issues related to what you do every day. And so if that's something that's interested in, uh, interesting to you then what I'd ask you to do is at the end when we're all done uh, raise your hand and then we'll talk and arrange a time where you can spend uh, 30 minutes to an hour with me or one of the people in the Deming collaboration and find out what your business is, what you do, and see how what we offer can be useful to you. Uh, because you should feel comfortable with the people you're working with. And the peer groups we run, we want people to fit in and uh, so that we don't spend a lot of time trying to sell people on the ideas and get right down to work. The last thing is if you might be interested some time, then just uh, afterwards drop me an email and I'll see to what you get on the mailing list and keep getting information. What I won't do is uh, send out information uh, because I just my time is too valuable. I don't have time to do that unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of people who need help especially in this economy. So anyways we'll get to that at the end. Back to the show. Um, now I'm going to talk about the opposite. We're going to talk about what to do. It's a bit unfair to provide you with the secrets of how to fail in a recession without also supplying the antidotes. However, we've been practicing doing things wrong for such a long time, and each, I'm, each of you, I'm sure, have found some things you recognize, either that you're doing or that your clients are doing or that, of course, people you know are doing. And uh, uh, the right things to do, the effective things to do, are less well known, obviously, if you take a look at the state of our economy. 
and it would be foolish to pretend we could cover them in any depth here. So uh, um, what I want to do is uh, present them, and as I said at the end, if there are things that interest you in exploring further, then uh, you can take me up on my offer. The first and most important thing, if you want to succeed, is to stop using the financial report as your sole source of information about your business. Let me explain. Uh, modern financial accounting is an outgrowth of the uh, Renaissance and really didn't change much until the great necessity arose during the uh, Industrial Revolution. And the rules by which we operate, which are a fact of life and by which anyone who has investors or works with banks is going to have to operate, are the generally accepted accounting practices or GAAP. And those are based on the financial reporting uh, standards that were put into place in the 1930s worldwide for the first time. And then again, I think it was in the 1980s that the balance sheet started showing up in the generally accepted accounting practices. And the aim of these was not to help you run your business better. The aim of these were to protect the investors in the business, whether they be banks, uh, venture capitalists, or individual investors. It was a way of them getting a snapshot of how much value there was in their investment for them to be able to decide to keep it or to sell it. Now that is a conflicting motivation to wanting to run a business well. And to run a business well, you really need to know how, in particular, work, raw materials, and money flow through your system in a, on a daily, if not a re real-time basis. Because that's really where the money's made. Uh, if you can imagine a triangle with a square sitting on top of it, the square is where you add value to your product or service. The triangle is support. Uh, and at either end, you can say there are inputs coming in of some kind of raw material and outputs or products to customers. Um, and uh, you might have a little side pool with inventory if you make too much inventory. But if you see this triangle and then this rectangle or square of where you add value, in some companies, the triangle is very big. In other companies, the triangle is very small. In some companies, the money and the raw material flows very easily through. Some, it's a very difficult process to get them through. The ones that it flows easily through are the ones that are converting the money invested in raw materials or in knowledge, right, more quickly into cash and on the same dollar invested are making much more profit, right? I call it the repeater effect. I have a video up about it on uh, my website and also on, the, uh, on YouTube. And it's a very, there's a quick explanation and a much more in-depth explanation. But it's the reason why some companies are much more profitable even though they may be getting the same amount of sales. It's because they don't need to invest as much money because they turn the dollars more. Now, one of the ways to do that is to liberate trapped resources. If you have things that are tied up in excess inventory, in excess process inventory, or too many business machines, or you know, you spent money on it and you held it around even after depreciation went away, get rid of them, particularly in a recession. Sell them and turn that into cash that they can be converted into raw materials or knowledge that can then be sold and turned into profit. Uh, now, in this process of trapped resources is inventory. Now, Inventory is a necessary evil. You have to have some, and in fact, you have to buffer, depending on the kind of industry in, uh, your changes. If you work in agriculture, for instance, and I've worked with a lot of agricultural companies, you have a thing called the growing season, and you had better grow enough in the growing season to be able to sell for the rest of the year. So the ability to manage your inventory becomes very, very important. Um, but having excess inventory means you don't have money and in a recession, that can be the difference between going out of business and staying in business. And one of the best ways to do that, of course, is to have less support. Uh, there's, if you look at your processes in every company, and even I find this, I spend an awful lot of my time doing things that really don't have a return and probably aren't that necessary, like chatting on LinkedIn, and uh, when I could be using that time towards talking to customers. Why? For a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is... Um, uh, it's not much fun to cold call in a lot of cases. But there's also the example where we do things that we don't, we've done it for so long we don't even know how stupid it is, like uh, this where you burn the toast and I'll scrape it. And uh, I've seen many, many, many 
uh, companies that have written procedures that have this kind of procedure written into it. So take a look and see where you can minimize the, where you have the support, where you're fat. It, the next is, is to understand variation. Now, for some of you, this is familiar territory, but for those of you that, that it isn't, uh, everyday faults built into the system are natural variation. It's common variation. Um, they give rise to uncertainty because we see things changing, and most people react to them all the time. But really fixing natural variation only makes it worse because, A, you don't know what the cause is. B, it's natural. You're not going to know what the cause is. And C, it can take your attention away from the things that really do need to be taken care of, the faults from fleeting events that, in Deming language, we call special variation, that are signals that something must be done. That, and these must be found. They must be studied. They must be understood. They must be dealt with. You need to have a, have a way that you can separate the noise, the natural variation, from the special variation. Now, you need look no further than the business uh, uh, reporters on television to see an example of people pretending that data means something when it doesn't because they're constantly looking at natural variation and, and, and ascribing meaning to it. And it's a waste of time. Uh, friends of mine, just uh, uh, clients, who I've been working with for a while, just ran con uh, uh, a thing called a control chart, which tells you the difference between natural and special cause variation on the exchange rate between the Mexican peso and the United States. And despite their convictions and the changes, it's a complete. It's really a very stable process. It's almost, you know, there's not really much reacting that can be done. If you do, you're just going to be gaming the system, and in the end, you're going to game it right. Sometimes you're going to lose. Other times, you're better off just, you know, kind of riding with the mean with the average. So common causes are things like, you, know, you don't need a chart to figure this out, poor workflow, ill-designed equipment, lack of training on the people, built-in inefficiency, anything out of this kind of norm, these built-in things that affect the flow of work, uh, signals a special cause. Uh, examples of special causes could be illness of employees, uh, new clients coming in all of a sudden, weather, uh, business fads, uh, Changes in federal regulations, which you have no control over but have to respond to. A uh, loose flywheel or a loose gear, a new employee. Uh, those are special causes. And those are things that can be dealt with each in their own particular way. Obviously, you tighten the flywheel and you train the new employee. Um, but tampering is when you treat a natural variation, when you react to it, or when you don't pay attention to a special cause variation in some sense. And we saw a classic example of the effects of tampering with the failure of the banking system, where instead of wanting to live with the, the, the center, they wanted to play on the margins and extend the time and the amount of money they could make off of investments, so they gamed the system. And the problem is, is that sooner or later, it's going to correct and come back. And when it does, you know, as they say, those, that which goes up must come down. And it usually goes down as far as it went up. And that's what happened. And the sound you're hearing right now is the sound of all available capital being sucked out of our system by the banking failures. So um, the idea is not to tamper. The idea is to understand. To answer the age-old questions of who, what, why, when, where, and how. And to do that, what I recommend and what I work with is very simple tools. Dr. Deming once said that all you really need is uh, 30 minutes and a um, piece of paper to be able to figure out what's in data. And I still think that holds true. Um, I don't like anything that takes people away from observing directly on the work floor unless it's absolutely necessary. The more you can do work where things are actually happening in reality, in the moment and seeing, the more effective you're going to be. And you have to be aware of the tyranny of the urgent. So the first thing is to visualize. We understand things much better if we visualize. Even tables of data, can, we can miss things. But if we put them into some kind of visual chart, just something simple done with a pen and paper. Even a graph can be done on graph paper, even in this day of calculators and uh, statistical programs. Uh, here's an example of one that actually was done by the um, uh, Toyota. Uh, company. It's from the book, the Toyota Way Field Book. Uh, and it was a uh, manager, and in, in Toyota, your job is to spend 40% of your time just looking at things. And this is a manager who 
sat there and he had gotten a complaint from his crew that they needed one more person that they couldn't keep up with their work. So he went and he just stood for 40 minutes watching what was going on and drew the little picture. It didn't look anything as nice as this. It was all stick figures. And then he, without judging, sat down with the workers and started talking about it. And what they noticed is that they had six operators and everyone was getting their own supplies from a bin in the middle and then everyone was going to bring it to a little window to, which went into the next room, which was actually, in this case, it was shipping, but it could have easily have been moving on to the next process. Uh, and then they talked about it and they, you know, threw some ideas and then they came up with a theory. So, you know, he said, they said, Together, let's see what happens if rather than hiring a new person, we actually get rid of one person. But we make that person line support, and we do it on a rotating basis so people don't get bored. And that person is the one who's constantly making a circuit from the material storage to the workers on one side, drops off their stuff at the shipping, and then goes to the other side, drops off the material that they need to work, and keeps doing the circuit, and everybody else can focus on the work that needs to be done. Now. If you see these pictures, it's very easy to understand, and it's so clear that this is obviously much more effective. Um, it led to many, many, many dollars in savings for uh, Toyota, and it's one example of some two million projects they do overall in a year. And I must say that Toyota is not the only company that practices this. In our own uh, United States, there's Colgate, there's many companies that are really Deming companies that not only practice process control, but also practice uh, trying to build the culture to be one that allows people to have pride in what they do and to have joy in their work, which is the uh, essential transformation that's central to the Deming ideas, not just process control. The other thing to do is to ignore snapshots. The P&L is a snapshot, and the worst snapshot of all is the uh, balance sheet. They tell you what happened in one moment in time, but reality does not happen in one moment of time, and one moment of time does not give you context. If beer costs 681 this month, what does that tell me? Nothing. Even if I know that a year ago against the average it was 500, and a month ago it was 300, now I'm 600, how am I supposed to know that a year ago was what was normal, or six months ago was what was normal? The only way you can really see that is in a time chart. and. Uh, this allows you to map over time what's happening with something, and you get an idea of the fluctuations of variation that take place. And if you're really sophisticated, you learn how to by Googling it or by um, joining in on one of our uh, events or from any, from any of the many numbers of places or from the book Understanding Variation by Donald Wheeler from the Statistical Process Control Press. You learn how to do an easy uh, control chart and that'll tell you the upper limit of natural variation, the lower limit, and as long as the line is in between, you know that that's all noise and there's really not, nothing good can come up trying to do anything about it. But the point is to map it over time, not react the way everybody does in most companies to the P&L every month and waste tons of resources that could have been spent actually making a difference. The next thing is to match output to demand. It's one of the principles that uh, uh, came out of Henry Ford and uh, Taichi Ono. And uh, contrary to what most people believe, uh, Ono really did not have much to do with Deming's thinking. He didn't really understand it, and it was not important to him, which is nothing to take away from him. His thinking was profound, obviously. Um, and then the next thing is don't cut, streamline. Uh, uh, over and over and again, and you can see some tapes on this at the Deming collaboration, people cut costs in a recession, and that really causes problems for them because, for instance, they'll buy a cheaper product, then down the road where they don't see it, it ends up in unhappy customers or in rework, and it actually ends up costing the company more. So another quick example is we were working with a company to understand the inner workings and had the general manager and the owner and some of the supervisors, some of the workers working together and observing what happened to the traffic patterns in the office. And what we saw was very interesting. We, we traced where people walked and where they came in over a 21, 22 minute period. We found that there was this big black blotch in front of a table. And on that table there was a uh, a multifunction thing that officers seem to like nowadays that's a combination fax machine, scanner, and printer. 
As we looked into it further, it seems that actually there had been a request for a, another copier, and the manager, in taking a look at it, when uh, looking at the costs, when it came to buying time to buy it, did an analysis, and what they their thinking was this, that uh, a copier alone costs $1,500 if you add to that um, the cost of a, a printer and a fax machine, an expensive printer and a fax machine, take up the slack, it's about $1,800. Um, whereas a uh, multifunction machine, a much cheaper multifunction machine they were able to get for about $250 at Office Depot. So, plain common sense, fax machine costs 250 versus $1,800 for the individual machines of them all, then you have $1,550 savings. Great! So we just saved $1,550 for the company. Or did we? Because on further investigation, when we did a work time study, what we found was that each worker was losing about four hours a week. There were six workers in the office. So that's about 24 hours lost in the office waiting to be able to use the machines that were on that, you know, on this little table here. Not a very good use of people's time, and it, though it's um, in another country and the, the, the pay rates are lower, it would still came to about $240 a week and lost money, literally paying people to stand still and money that was being paid out. Now, it doesn't take much to realize that $1,500 we supposedly saved would be enough very quickly, but $240 a week lost. It would take about oh, just a little bit more than six weeks to do that, and then we would continue to lose that money over the period of the year, every year that the machine operates. $240 a week, so that comes to over $12,400 a year lost, being spent paying people once again to just stand around. Cost-cutting looks at only one small part of the puzzle. So the aim is to, to always look at total cost. Never look at the cost of any one thing. Look at how everything interrelates and trying to figure out, using your visualizations, try to figure out what is going to be the lowest total cost. Or better, focus on improving the quality of what you make. And when you improve, focus on improving the quality of your goods or services, your costs always will go down. And uh, then cultivate pride and joy. I mean, I'm dead serious. And I've had very serious businessmen look at me cross-eyed. But the core, the essential lesson of Dr. Deming is pride and joy. People who enjoy their work are going to be give more of themselves. And wouldn't we rather have businesses filled with many people working at their best with full engaged motivation than businesses that have one or two people with whips and a couple of heroes and then a lot of people who are, as a, a human resources vice president at a company I worked at once said, uh, um, not rocket scientists. Uh, everyone has something to contribute and many brains is always more powerful than just one or two. Then learn to do simply looking. Learn to quiet your mind and just look. It's the, one of the most powerful tools that you can have because it sidesteps all of the pre misconceptions, all of the prejudices that we bring with us and uh, predispositions when we look at something that we don't get when we're looking at a spreadsheet. To do simply looking, you have to go to where the work is taking place, where the action is, and just look, and then do some little drawings of what you're seeing, and then talk about it with people, and, and work with people in teams. Okay. And very, very important is the idea of looking outside in. It's a concept that I learned from the people who um, actually did the initial strategic plan for Starbucks. It's a very successful way to look at your strategic planning, which is to put yourself in the shoes of someone else. Uh, I used to say when I worked in the supermarket, go outside of the store and walk in the store and see it through the eyes of the customer. And that will really help you understand what your job should be. So, you know, don't waste your resources chasing prospects in a recession. They're going to be hard to get. Focus on ones you have. They probably know people they can refer to you if, they, if you help them out. 
even if that means you have to lower the price of what you do in order to survive. Other ideas are, of course, that you can cut back on labor, not by laying people off, but by getting everybody together in a team and discussing ideas like everybody goes to 32 hours instead of 40 so we don't have to lay anybody off. Um, these are things you can do that people will appreciate as opposed to not appreciating. Uh, and finally, the final slide is, is, is if you really want to succeed, don't focus on sales only. Uh, uh, sales are the outcome of providing a product that people need that's a very high quality. Of course you have to go talk to people. You have to do meet and greets. But it shouldn't only be a focus on sales. Because a focus on sales, doing things to constantly drive sales, like the Christmas sales we just had on Friday, really kill customer loyalty. The people who come and buy at those sales are not your loyal customers. And in the end, they kill profits. They hurt your profits. And uh, if you focus on costs alone, oddly enough, after a period of time where you know, you'll see a benefit for a short period of time, but long term, you will always drive costs up because of suboptimization. And you'll always drive the initiative of people down because they can see they're working with cheaper and cheaper goods. And that, but if you focus on quality, you will drive sales. You will lower costs. You will increase profit. And you'll build trust between you and the people that you're spending your time with. So remember, your brain is your most powerful tool. And uh, um, we... I would like very much if uh, this isn't the last time we have communication and that you join me for more webinars and uh, consider uh, taking a look at the peer groups and training. And as I said, in excuse me, I'm going to talk a little bit in Portuguese to the one member who's here from Sao Paulo. Tudo bem, Mario? Hello, Dan. Tudo bem. Um prazer falar contigo. É uma novidade para mim também, mas foi bastante instrutiva a sua palestra. Inclusive, o teu foco aí, bem mais, não tão tecnicista, né, mas muito mais valorizando o ser humano aí, que é algo... Eu tenho clientes também, também sou consultor de empresas, e tenho alguns clientes que só pensam em números, 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 e a moral vai para o chão, a moral é zero. 